I mean, geez. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Shh. Sorry, my my dog. <laughs> She'll bite someone's toenails off. Mine can't decide if he wants to come in or out of the room. Well, I brought her in here because she, then she scratches at the door. She doesn't hear too well, so that's kind of a good thing. <laughs> Mine hops up on the, I'm on like a lean back chair. He hops up on the, the footrest and gets as close to the screen and the feet as possible. Oh, I just got your text. <laughs> <laughs> I heard somebody pop in, but then it disappeared. So, so do you? Um, oh, here it comes Tom. So, do you see up at the top, Jordan, um, that little banner thing? That's when mm -hmm. you, we were going to start the um, okay. the actual meeting. So everyone will be in a waiting room until you hit that button, and then they all come in. Got it. So Got it. Um, now, if you want to make me a co-host or. And yeah, then that get, way I'll have controls. Let's get Tim in here just to say hi. Hi, Tim. Hey, everybody. How are you? Good morning. Good. Good morning. Good. Where are you uh, joining in from, Tim? I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona. So. Oh, nice. I was there a couple weeks ago. Yeah, we're uh, here on vacation or stuff. Hockey like tournament. Work? Hockey oh, tournament. Good for you. Yeah, but we did play. Uh, I took a couple groups out to uh, talking sticks, so we did enjoy some sunshine. Nice, nice. 
Can yeah, everybody cool. hear me clearly? And uh, is yeah. video okay? Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. we're good. Um, all right, Diane, let me see here. Should I just make everybody a co-host? Sure. If you pardon me, folks, I'm going to step out for just a minute. I need to grab a prop that I'll be using throughout yeah. my presentation. So okay. I'll be right back. Cool. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Should, um, I, should I co-host oh. him as well in advance? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I will have my video and audio off. Okay. So, but if you, you know, need me, just say something. Okay, and I'll text I you. I don't need to be seen. Joe, you got the flow going today. I got, I, yeah, I, I was hat shamed yesterday, so I figure I'd not wear a hat today. <laughs> so, which doesn't happen very often. I got the, I think so, I don't know some people think I'm bald or something. I'm like, no, I got, I got too much hair. That's my problem. Hat shamed. I think it's unruly. <laughs> Where's your home base, Joe? I'm in uh, Maumee, Ohio, just outside. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, I'm actually uh, home this, doing this from home this morning because it's much more it's much more quiet here than it is at work. So you have crappy weather just like we do. Yeah, we're we. You guys probably have a little bit crappier weather, but we're probably close to the same belt. Yeah, I was up in Flint Saturday and. And then I rode up to Franken with, with my wife afterwards because we'd never been there. But man, it, they they're definitely in a separate band than we are. They had mm -hmm. inches of snow on the ground up there. Yeah, we, we have nothing. Yeah, we have no snow either. Yeah. And then at, in Plymouth, you know, thirty miles north of here, there's got to be six, seven inches. Yeah, that's what it was up there. We probably have about three, three inches. You were, were you at Saginaw or something or? Lansing? Um, St. Lansing. John's. Yeah, okay. Just about 20 miles uh, north from East Lansing. Okay. Right in the so, middle. Um, Joe, I have you at the bottom of the hour to go over some stuff. Do you have anything you want to share? Uh, yeah. Share screen wise. Yeah, let me um. Let me Make share. Make sure your share screen's working. Yeah, I'm doing that right now. Let me try this again. So I have so these are the pictures I these are the pictures I have. Uh, I just took cool. these when they come up. So that's our actual building. So full park lot, some cars out in the back. I would have those preloaded already. Yes. Then you just click on it at the bottom of your screen. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, Not coming up. Problem is the Zoom things. Well, I would go into view on the top there. I wonder why it's... Well, I can go like, I can go like this, but let me... I feel like it opened it though, didn't it? <clears throat> yeah, so I can go, I mean, this is this is fine, right? For me just to scroll right through them. We can't see anything. Yeah. You can't see this? We can only see your folder with the pictures inside the folder. Yeah, and uh, it looked go, like it opened it when you clicked on it. Go yeah. to view. Go to view mode on the top. Hold on a second. Let me do this. Let me redo this. <clears throat> so now that I have them pre-opened, now can you see it? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So that's our building. This Way is better. Pretty different. I mean, it's so plus we got another. 3,000 square feet of office right here, and then another 2,000 square feet of um, more warehouse space in the back. So, yeah, I just think people like to see that kind of. That's fine. You know, 
brick and mortar stuff. And okay. now let's leave this. Okay. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go in and pull mine oh. up. Oh, hey, hold on, Jordan. Jordan, went real real quick. Let me let me do one more thing. Um, do you have any cab cab drawings or cab? That's yeah. So I want to see a few things. So this is um. I'll stop share real quick and let this pull up, and then I'll reshare. Um, so that, I mean, I don't have full renderings here, but let me see if I can pull up a full rendering one. But so when people ask for schematics and how we how we determine screen and where the technology goes and where the projector goes and we do like a shadow image on the screen we put where the electrical goes where the conduit goes and so yeah that's I'll, good. Um, I'll pull up something that actually has renderings in it as well so i'll work okay. on that here in a minute okay i'm gonna uh i'm gonna pull up some of the foresight pictures yeah. for just from online that we have and some stuff that you've done <clears throat> All right, just confirm that uh, that you guys can see these. Can you guys see all those? Well, there's two folders, and then oh, there's a Word document, and then a picture. Okay, so you guys cannot see those. All right. <clears throat> see anything there? Yes. One one picture. Yes. Okay, I've got to get to scroll mode. So you'll still see the folder, or do you guys see one picture? Just the same, the two folders, the Word document, and then the picture. Still the same? Yes. I don't know why that's not working. Um, <clears throat> I see uh, pictures, but oh, there you go. So it looks like you've opened them. How about now? Can you see different pictures? Just a bunch of pictures, yeah. Hmm. How many pictures do you want to show? I just said like 20 different ones. I was just going to scroll through real quick, but usually I just scroll through them and you can see them all as they change, but. Yeah, that's kind of weird. You, normally you have no problem with this. We're talking yeah, about. I know. Uh, um, try it again. Click on that first one and then see if. So you're not seeing the big the big picture. No. 
But you're seeing the whole folder now. Yeah. Correct. All the, yeah, all the pictures open. Somewhere in view up here, I should be able to go to like. Uh, what's like, um? Like what's it called when you scroll through all the pictures? Usually, usually I open up my, like when I had to do it, I had to I had to click on the pictures, and then my. Um, oh. Whatever software I use, whatever software I use to actually view the pictures is what you need to open. Yeah, I might just skip that. Go back to um, <clears throat> some of those um, prompts up. Um, like up here? Yeah, let me see something. What is options? What is What does that show all the way to the right? Options? Change folder and search. Oh, okay. Um, and then what is navigation pane? Go back to view. Hey, Jordan. Yeah. Go ahead and open up a picture. Okay, hang on. Now, now go and share that actual picture and see if you can scroll through them. Like, stop sharing this particular screen. Oh, hang on. I'm going to stop share. Try to stop share. All right, let's see what I have opened up here. There you go. That's, that's what it? you want. Yeah, okay. that's what you want. I don't know what I did differently, but I guess it worked. Okay. Um, Tim, you can hear us? Okay. Loud and clear. Cool. Um, just to give you a kind of a, I don't know if, if Joe mm -hmm. sent you the window that you have, kind of like a 20 minute window from 1110 to 1130. Yep. And uh, tell us a little bit about what you got going on for today, what, you, what your angle is. I'll do a quick little intro as far as who I am, where I come from, kind of background okay. in the industry. Um, I'm actually new to the Foresight Sports team, but I'm very familiar with all their products. Uh, most recently was with uh, TrueSpec Golf uh, as one of their executive vice presidents uh, in charge of all club research and uh, fitting education. So awesome. um, I'm very well versed on the optical systems that Foresight delivers. And uh, I'm just going to go into some of the differences between Doppler and optical. Uh, I think that a lot of folks may see data from one system or the other system and think that one system or the other may be wrong. And in reality, that's not the case. They're both right. They're just measuring different points in time uh, and different points on the golf club. Um, so I think that would be important content to get out to the guys. That's cool. uh, and then we'll also talk about the benefits of optical in the indoor setting. There are a couple of things on the Doppler side that on the indoor setting uh, that are being calculated and not measured. And that's a core differentiation that I think is important to understand if you are an indoor operator working in the sim environment, that some of the data you're going to see on one technology versus the other is, is going to be different. Um, and then from there, we'll get into a couple of the core products. And then uh, the big thing that I want to kind of get into, I have a little club here that I'm going to use 
Uh, instead of using a magnetic lie angle tool, we're going to talk about uh, face angle, lie angle, and loft, and the effect that has on face normal, which is this little T. So that'll cool. be a quick, quick little discussion, and then I'll open it up for questions. So awesome. hopefully, hopefully that uh, ticks the boxes. And um, if there's anything specific you think I should really drill down on, I'd be all ears. No, I think that's great. I mean, I'm a foresight user. I've got a quad. I got another one on the way, and Joe's, you know, obviously pretty close with foresight. So, yep. Thank you for being on, and appreciate your knowledge and expertise and sharing and. I think we got about 45 or 50 people that are, that are checked in. Great. This is kind of new for us up here trying this. Um, I'm, I'm the Michigan awesome. rep for, for Joe. So I'm connected throughout the section pretty well and figured uh, instead of telling all my students, no, I don't have any buddy for them to go to now. Now we do. So awesome. And Ace Indoor Golf is kind of the title sponsor over the, over this webinar. Correct. And then, uh, I'm, I'm presenting on behalf of Foresight for Ace Indoor as uh, the sponsor of the event, correct? Correct. Correct. All right. I just want to make sure I present it properly and, yeah. and thank all the right people yeah. and take care of all that stuff. So. And Diane, who's with us, is from the section office, and she's helping organize all this. And she knows that we want to make this fun and not too technical and, and formal. She knows I'm not a real formal person, so <laughs> we, we like to have fun and, and, uh, and do some good stuff. I host a radio show that we do the same thing like this all the time, and, and we just, like, an hour goes by quick. It's fun, and yeah. interac interaction is the best, so. Yeah. This is a very familiar format. I've done about 30 of these things in the last 18 months with different awesome. sections around the country. And, oh, okay. That's cool. Uh, I also, I host a podcast with golf magazine and golf.com. So awesome. I'm very used to this kind of format and I'll probably end up taking more than my 20 minutes, but I'll do my best to stay <laughs> in my lane. Or you're I know. talking to PGA professionals then. Yeah. <laughs> As exactly. I write down the, uh, the deadlines for everything, I'm like, there's no way the none of these are going to even follow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to get through it quickly. My role and title within Foresight is uh, Global Director of Business Development. So if, when, uh, when you toss it over to me, if you want to intro that way, that would be, that would hit the mark. And um, looking forward no, to it. We are saving questions. I saw to the last kind of 15 minutes. Is that Well, I mean, I just, people can ask questions as, as we go. Um, and Tim, I don't know what, you know, I don't do a ton of these type things, but uh, we have a Q&A area. Um, Joe kind of wanted to have people ask questions on the fly, so maybe we can hit some of them as we, as we can. I don't know if that works for you. And then at the end of your segment, certainly we can have specific foresight stuff, and you're more than welcome to yep. hang out for the whole, for the whole hour. Uh, we're going to have Q&A towards the, towards the end as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, my experience having done these is it's usually best to hold questions toward the end of each segment okay. um, because otherwise you, you run the risk of going down a rabbit hole that you never get to any of the content <laughs> you want to talk to. Yeah, I've had, that happen, at, uh, had yeah. that happen at the Golf Magazine Teachers Summit last year, the Top 100 Summit. I had an hour-long presentation and we opened it up for questions and we never got to slide one. Oh, gosh. <laughs> There's always that one guy that's got eight questions, yeah. right? So Michael maybe... Finney. Michael Finney is his name, and he has a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, we know. So maybe, Jordan, just when you're kicking it off, you can announce that. Yeah, I've got kind of like do's and don'ts. So. Yeah, yeah. Jordan, can you run down the um, itinerary real quick just so we're all... So I'm just going to do a quick intro and welcome and thank the section and Diane. Um basically describe why we're doing this. I'll talk about the questions format uh, when, when we want to attack those. Uh, why this opportunity? Why, why we're involved? Um, obviously learning every day. And then we'll, we'll kick it right off right away. So at 1110 is my goal or maybe even earlier. I mean, I'd like to give Tim as much time as possible. I think I can get through my stuff in like five minutes. So we might go even as early as 11.05 and that would be my goal but right. uh, we got 11.10 just because I know I like to talk and babble a little bit too much too so um, 
1130. So we'll go Q and A on the foresight. You know, I don't know how much time, whenever you're comfortable with that, Tim, I'll just let yeah. you handle that. Okay. Uh, you know, when you want to open that up and then there's, I'm not going to kick you off, but you know, 1130, it's not a hard time at all. Yep. None of these are set in stone. If we got good content going, I'll just go with it. Yep. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't mind if foresight. So two questions. One, Jordan, are you going to mention um, our referral program that we're doing with the section when you talk? Uh, not now. Not now? Okay. No. Two, yeah, Tim, if you're, if you're going strong and they have questions and it's a strong interaction with foresight, feel free to keep on going, man. I, all right. This is a, all yeah. about us providing a service to the pros. I think most of them don't understand what we're doing. I mean, obviously, for selfish reasons, I want to make sure that our deal with the pros gets out there. Yep. But, it, you know, and quite frankly, I, I told you last night, I look forward to hearing you too. So it's, it was uh, quite the education. So I um, don't, if you're going, do not feel that you need to stop and give me time. I've, I got Absolutely. six of these webinars to do. I'll have plenty of time in the future. <laughs> Sounds good. And for and for my knowledge, like if any of the section professionals want to do anything in the simulator space, whether it be for their you know their club or you would you'll be a a, a a resource for them to reach out to to basically walk through getting the simulators built and constructed that's we, that's and put the, together. The whole that's your core business. Yeah. 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 So that's that's, our, yeah, so we sell for you guys, and you know the point of us doing this is for, and especially since we're here in Toledo. One, yeah. they don't have to pay state sales tax, which obviously is key, but we're, we're close. So we handle everything. We usually visit the site um, yeah. ahead of time to look at it. And then we provide the first line of defense with regards to customer service and any issues. Um, so yeah, that's the purpose of, of us doing this is that they reach out to through Jordan to ACE and then we take the sale. Um, obviously yeah. foresight benefits as well, but that's, that's why we're doing this. That's what I figured. I want to make sure I position it, you know, properly as we tend to go through the yeah. the segment. So, okay. and uh, Tim, is it is it Brienne or Brienne? Yeah, that's Brienne. perfect. Okay, okay, I'll do my best on that one. Okay. So, Diane, when people are coming in, uh, are you going to see them or am I going to see them? We all will. Okay. There should be. Um, <clears throat> You can open up the attendees um, and it might populate, I think, in the participant area. It might show like attendees and then you could actually have a bar open to show who's on the call. Okay. Um, Is there, uh, should I just hit the broadcast like at, at 11 o'clock and then yeah once you guys are ready to rock yep start webinar and then give it a maybe like a minute for everyone okay. to kind of pop in and then yeah we, i might give them i might give like three or four minutes before i get going after 11 we'll see how many people are in i mean I, quite honestly i'd start it okay i'd start I'll, right at 11. i'll be back in two minutes folks just want to uh, use the restroom before we get going. Okay. Be right back. Yep. And like I said, I'm going to be muted and um, my video will be off, but just, you know, say my name or something. It says uh, attendees cannot join until you broadcast. Should I just hit broadcast now? No, just, I would wait right till 11. Okay. Because we're recording. Yeah. But, but what if people can't come in right now? But, the, but they'll see us. Like, just like we're talking right now, that's what they're going to see in here. Gotcha. So once, you know, you're ready to hit that button, that's when you start. Okay. Yep. It'll be fine. You guys have done enough of these. Oh, yeah. I just want to make sure. I think going forward, we'll have just a little segment of, uh, I don't want to say a, a PowerPoint, but couple of things to show. I it, then, yeah I don't want to make it too technical but yeah and then we can also you know like I have this um these on our education page on our website whatever content we could always just you know put a link mm -hmm. and yeah um you know for you know leave behinds or something or whatever so we can put that on there too so cool yep
Make sure everybody's phone is muted. Yeah, I did that. Everybody's texting me and calling me about last night's hockey game. Oh. You guys probably don't even know. All the juniors? No. Yeah. Go, go USA? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> I think you're outnumbered here, dude. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I, I don't even follow it, though. I mean, <clears throat> I just yeah. know that was a uh, an upset. So Yeah, 2 nothing lost by Canada. So. Oh, Yikes. So yeah, I get to hear from all my American hockey friends for another year and probably pretty aggressively for the next two weeks. <laughs> when are, when is NHL starting? Uh next Saturday. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yay. All right, 11 for 10.59. Okay, I'm going to Cognito here. Okay. I'm just going to start the broadcast. I'll wait for a few here. <clears throat> All right, guys, we are live broadcasting, but we'll wait and see. We've got uh, people popping in right now. As mentioned, we have about 45 to 50 attendees today. So thank you for all of you guys that have joined and gals. We'll get started here shortly. My name is Jordan Young. I'm joined by Joe Newmeyer and our special guest, Tim Brianne. We'll get going in a in about 30 seconds here. Once I see that number get a little over 40. All right, guys, gals, thanks for joining. This is uh, Jordan Young, Joe Newmeyer, and Tim Brand here joining today. Special thanks to the Michigan section for letting us do this educational uh, one hour spin on simulation. Uh, also special thanks to Diane Lazarus for, for putting this together with us and going behind the scenes. Hopefully uh, this will all run smoothly. Um, as you know, with Zoom and all these crazy things that are going on right now, could black out at any time, but we'll get you back on. If you have any issues, uh, reach out to me via text or email uh, or to Diane at the office and we'll get you back together real quick. Um, I guess the reason why we wanted to do something like this was to provide an opportunity for all of you, uh, number one, for education, but number two, to get the word out there about simulation, uh, how busy, how productive it is, uh, how useful it is, and how it's booming right now. And, and Joe Newmeyer, who is here with me from Ace Indoor Golf, who is one of our section sponsors and also one of the sponsors of this little uh, education seminar, uh, can tell you that it's been crazy. And I'm sure Tim uh, from Foresight Sports can also say the same thing. So Joe, thanks for being a part of it. Um, we hope you guys learn a lot. Uh, this, is, this is a cool event. This will be going on for six sessions. Uh, so every, two, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, uh, a couple times each month into March. And we hope you guys learn, enjoy, get interactive, ask a lot of questions. The Q&A will be available. Uh, after each section, we'll get to the Q&A. So when Tim from Foresight here Sports presents, he'll have some Q&A towards the end of his presentation. We'll also reserve some time at the end of the hour for Q&A as well. So if you'd like to ask your questions, please put them in the Q&A box. 
I'll monitor them, write them down, and we'll get to those as soon as possible. So again, uh, Jordan Young here with Joe Newmeyer. We're gonna hand it off to Mr. Tim Friend, who is the Global Director of Business De Development with Foresight Sports. Very knowledgeable, probably a lot smarter than me, maybe not smarter than Joe, who knows, but uh, <laughs> we're gonna hand it off to Tim. Thanks for being with us, and uh, let's hear all we gotta do about Foresight Sports. First and foremost, Joe and Jordan, thank you so much for giving Foresight the opportunity. Uh, Diane over at the section office with the Michigan section, thanks so much for having us on. And good morning, everybody. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to join us and uh, talk a little bit about simulation, uh, simulation technology, and specifically Foresight Sports. So uh, as Jordan mentioned, my role with Foresight Sports is Global Director of Business Development. Uh, it's actually a new post for me. Uh, I recently joined the team from True Spec Golf, which is a brand agnostic fitting company. Uh, and um, I would like to think that I'm one of the more knowledgeable folks uh, in the space when it comes to technology. Uh, we engaged in a very in-depth uh, third-party independent testing program at my former uh, position. And uh, I wanted to share with you some of the information that we were able to gather from all that independent research. So. I think first and foremost, um, what is Foresight Sports? It's an optical, uh, optical technology company that delivers multiple different platforms uh, throughout the space uh, beyond just Foresight Quads, which is what a lot of folks have seen. You have Hawk simulators, which are multi-sport simulators, uh, and then you have other uh, technology products that are offered as well. Um, today, we're gonna focus on the optical launch monitor products uh, specifically, the, the, for some of you folks that have used the GC2 with HMT in the past, now the Foresight Quad. Uh, and basically what this is, is stereoscopic for a uh, launch monitor unit. So uh, I, I hear a lot of questions, which is better, Doppler or optical? Uh, and I hear that kind of broadly throughout the industry when it comes to technology in general. I think it's very important to understand that every technology has uh, things that it does very well, and then other things that may be a little more challenged. Uh, and so here today, we're going to talk about optical and what that can bring to your teaching and what that can bring to your coaching and fitting. Um, from an optical standpoint, what are the differences? Uh, if you look at the data outputs that you get from a quad unit or a foresight unit, and you compare that to any of the Doppler units that are out, you'll notice that there are certain parameters that are slightly different uh, in your data. And I think it's important to understand that this doesn't mean that one unit is right and one is wrong, so to speak. Um, it's very important to understand that optical launch monitors are measuring a different point on the club and they're measuring a different point in time. So optical launch monitors define impact as first touch. That's the moment that the club and the ball first meet. Uh, and if you look at a Doppler system, a Doppler system will define the moment of impact as ball separation or the moment that you get full compression of the golf ball against the face when it starts to rebound off the face of the club. Uh, obviously, there's a slight bit of difference between first touch and ball separation. There's some stuff that's happened in between, and some of the stuff that's happened in between does affect uh, the numbers and the way that the numbers uh, end up, or the data, the, the, the data outputs that you get. The next thing that's important to understand is that an optical system is measuring the face of the golf club, right at the very front of the face, whereas a Doppler system will be measuring the center of the volume. So. Uh, if you look at this product here, this driver product, somewhere in the middle of this volume is the center of volume. And that affects the way that the numbers uh, represent as well. So in general, you're going to see slightly slower club head speeds from a Doppler system, slightly faster uh, smash factors or efficiencies. Uh, and this is simply due to the fact that after the ball and club collision, the club loses just a little bit of club head speed as all of that energy is transferred into the ball. Um, and so there are, there are also some effects that it has over the path and angle of attack. Uh, so if you see a differential in the path and angle of attack numbers, uh, I think it's very important that you understand that neither system is right or wrong. Both of them are right in actuality. Uh, but uh, the differential is explained by the fact that they're measuring different points on the face uh, and measuring slightly different points in time. So uh, the question then becomes, well, when you're looking at the ball numbers, which ball numbers are uh, are a little bit more accurate. Um, our own findings, uh, back with my former responsibilities, is that in the indoor environment, uh, we were more comfortable using optical systems. And the reason that we're more comfortable using optical systems in the indoor environment are the club data, the, all the different club data that you get in the indoor environment 
is measured instead of calculated. That is a very, very important nuance here. When you're looking at the spin axis of the ball, the spin axis of the ball in the indoor setting when you're, when you're working on any Doppler system, system is going to be calculated off of the face of the path. If you see any variances or tolerances in that path number and the face to path number is being affected, that means that you'll also have spin axis that is affected as well. Uh, and this is something that we would see quite regularly. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to hit shots you know, on a sim, specifically a Doppler sim, and you'll hit a shot that feels a certain way, but then the graphical representation may be slightly different. Uh, and the reason is because the spin axis is being calculated off a of face to path. With an optical system, you're going to get an actual measurement. Um, uh, and, and so it's going to allow for a little bit greater accuracy. Uh, and it's, it's not a, a, a calculation of spin axis, but rather a measurement of spin axis. So whatever you see in the indoor environment, and you're talking about uh, shot curvature, shot shape is accurate to what actually happened. And then the last part that I think is worth really mentioning here is as fitters, uh, teachers, um, regardless of where your niche is in the industry, when you're talking player performance, uh, I think it's extremely important to understand the concept of face normal. Uh, this is a term that's used with club designers and gear heads. Um, and uh, hold on just one more moment here. I have a phone going off in the background. Let me make sure that turns off, folks. One, mo one quick second. All right, there we go. I think it's very important to understand the, the concept of face normal. Face normal is defined as perpendicularly, perpendicularity to the plane of the face of the club. So if I put a T or a magnetic triangle tool on the face of the club, that's going to tell me where face normal is pointed, quote unquote. Now, what constitutes face normal? Face normal is determined by loft. It's determined by face angle, whether the face is open or closed. And it's also determined by lie angle, whether the toe is digging or the heel is digging. This is a very, very important factor to understand what actually is going wrong. Uh, when we're talking about teaching and fitting, it's all about getting the club to deliver to the ball squarely in a path that's reasonable with a strike point that's centered or close to center in the face. Uh, obviously, you want those patterns to repeat as well. Uh, so when we're talking about whether we're teaching or fitting, it's all about getting this club delivered to the ball properly. Uh, and so I think that this is a very important concept that a lot of teachers and fitters really should understand is that wherever this T is pointed ultimately is the sum of all parts. So I can make this T point out to the push side or right side of the target by either opening the face or by digging the toe. In most cases, this T is pointed the same magnitude, you know, left or right of the target, depending upon how much I pitch the club in one direction or another. Uh, one of the things that I do find with optical, specifically the Foresight systems, is that the graphical representation that a Foresight system will give you of that impact interval, so that moment where the club and the ball meet, it breaks it down into the components of lie angle, leading edge face angle, as well as dynamic loft. Those are three very, very important components because I've seen quite frankly, uh, or excuse me, quite frequently, I do see on Doffer systems where it will represent that face normal is a little to the right of the target. So the question becomes, is the leading edge of the club square or is it open or is the toe of the club digging slightly? Knowing which, of, which, which is the culprit, so to speak, why is the ball starting right of the target? Well clearly because face normal is pointed to the right of target. Well, if it's starting to the right of target because of face normal, what's causing face normal to be right of target? Is it toe or is it face? That's a huge, huge differentiation to make when you're teaching and fitting. You have to know what you're fixing. Ultimately, if the, if the face normal is pointed to the right of the target because the leading edge is open, I can correct this club and get face normal to point back online if I make the club more upright because that's going to make the heel dig. But you can see the orientation of the golf club right now is very askew. You're not going to hit a lot of center face shots. Okay. And what I see a lot out of amateur, uh, what we see a lot out of amateur golfers is that they'll deliver the club with significant toe down angle, three, four degrees in some cases. And what they learn to do in reaction to that, that's obviously going to start the ball off to the right, is they actually start to learn to close the face. So they're striking the ball with a closed face with a severe toe dig. And that's how they try to get the ball to start online. Obviously, once again, this club is pitched in a very acute position. 
it's going to make it difficult to hit the center of the face. So I think it's very important to understand that when you're looking at what the club face is doing at impact, understand the concept of face normal, understand leading edge angle versus dynamic loft versus delivered lie angle and break it down into all three components. That's going to tell you what you actually need to fix as a teacher or a fitter. Very, very important point to make. Um, in general, when, I, when we're talking about Doppler and, Dop, uh, excuse me, uh, Doppler and optical, I think it's very important to understand the differences as far as downrange data as well. You know, everything that you do on a Doppler system, if you're outdoors using a real golf ball with minimal wind conditions and typical temperatures, there's no need to use a quote unquote normalized function. A lot of the Doppler systems nowadays have a normalized function, which standardizes the data into a certain environmental setting. Um, if you're using real golf balls on a range that's flat, then it doesn't make sense to normalize with a lot of the tour players that I've had the privilege of working with over the last 15 years in my career. We very rarely use the normalized function when we're working on a Doppler system outdoors, but limitations of the environment mean that most folks have to use normalized, whether it's the range balls that we use or what have you. It's important to understand the minute that uh, the, the, the normalized function is engaged that part of the ball flight is being disregarded on a Doppler system. So the inherent benefit of using a Doppler system, which is that it tracks the ball flight from start to finish, you're now disregarding the second portion of the flight. Um, when you look at the data coming out of an optical unit, specifically a quad or foresight, it's important to understand that that data is unaffected by environment. Uh, unless you hook it up to the software. So if you're look, just looking at the data that's coming out of the unit, um, that is unaffected by any environmental condition. Uh, and that's going to be data that is quote unquote pre-normalized. Uh, and then obviously if you add layers in within your software settings for different elevations or temperature settings, it's going to make adjustments to that data based upon those algorithms. So the one thing that I think is very important to understand for all you golf professionals out there is that there's a lot of tech out there these days and what's good versus what isn't good. Um, what I would prefer to do is, is say, what are the different technology platforms do well? Um, and the folks over at ACE indoors, you know, are as well versed in this as anybody in the business and being able to help figure out what the best solution is for each, each operator um, and <clears throat> how to deploy that solution. Uh, and I think it's very important to understand the benefits and the features uh, before you go all in on any piece of tech and really understand what this tech is going to do well and where it's challenged. Uh, that's something that I would highly advise. Uh, and then the last part that I'll get into here before we turn it over to some questions is um, when you're looking at the different suite of products that are available these days in the technology space, whether it be personal launch monitor devices, simulators, um, in general, a lot of the OEMs uh, have actually gone back to using optical for a lot of their own research and testing just because of the accuracy and precision and tolerances that you see out of optical systems. Um, the Doppler systems are used for ball flight and the optical systems are used for a lot of club data. That's a very important thing to mention. Uh, if I'm an instructor that's utilizing technology to help assess club delivery patterns, uh, I think that you're going to find that those delivery patterns are a little more precise and defined using any optical system out there because it's not using some of the ball flight to predicate the club positions. It's, it's capturing the data independently, meaning the club and the ball data. Uh, so with that, I hope that that helped provide a little bit more firm foundation as far as the differences between optical and Doppler. Uh, and I'd love to open it up for questions if anybody would, uh, would like to ask any questions about what was presented or general information at all regarding sim products foresight products uh, or optical um if anybody wants to ask some questions you can certainly type them in or um if you want you can bring yourself up live um i just had a couple questions tim uh recently i went through uh liam's uh training online they like to get all that stuff Pretty cool. Uh, he does such a great job speaking and presenting. Um, can you just touch base on that a little bit? Yeah, so peak performance. You know, Liam Mucklow, a uh, golf professional out of Canada, one of the industry leaders as far as innovation, and uh, one of my teammates at Foresight. 
um, has been part of a, an education program for quite some time called Peak Performance. Uh, and there's a lot of really good stuff in there, both applicable for teaching and fitting. Um, golf laboratories or, or golf labs up in Canada, rather, they do some really cool stuff where they do some in-depth in testing of golf clubs and product performance, looking at CG locations and bulge and rolls and things like that. They have a couple of different certifications within the peak performance, I believe, uh, that kind of specialize uh, into certain aspects of the business. Uh, but it's well worth everybody's time to check out. Uh, Liam, you know, none of the information you get from Liam is going to have any spin on it. Uh, that's one of <laughs> Liam's specialties that he cuts to the chase and, and is kind of no BS about the information he shares. So uh, I think a lot of folks would, would really find a lot of the, the information in those modules very useful, uh, not just for understanding, you know, optical systems and some of the foresight, but, but how it applies into teaching and fitting. And then most specifically, you're going to get some, some pretty in-depth uh, information uh, as far as the, the impact interval is what I call it, you know, what's happening at the moment of impact. It's a pretty complicated uh, set of calculations that all of these launch monitor companies use, uh, including us at Foresight, to really determine what happened at impact. There's a lot of stuff going on at impact. It's pretty complicated. And understanding that as a teacher and fitter, I think is crucially important if you want to make your students better. Um. Yeah, I mean, I went through it. There's a, there's two sections, I believe. One is free, so I would invite everybody to, to check out Peak Performance with Foresight. You don't have to pay anything for the first level. Second level is, is a fee, but it's good to get a, a feel for what Foresight, the quad, uh, how it operates, the details, nuts and bolts behind it. So if you're looking for a little bit of extra uh, education for free definitely definitely hit that up it's 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 not boring by any means i didn't usually when i do these <laughs> i tend to fall asleep but i love listening to liam he's great yep. you never know what's going to come out of his mouth so you got to kind of pay attention um personally on my side of things just to kind of give everybody a, an idea of what i do um many of you know me on the on the uh webinar here but some maybe do not i teach indoors and outdoors over at Fox Hills, uh, Plymouth. I run Jordan Young Golf there. Uh, last year, I purchased a Foresight Quad after many years of, of thinking about purchasing other systems. Um, I've used four uh, flight scope in the past. Um, I went with Foresight just because of the help with Joe and Ace Indoor Golf and the multi-usage where I can take it with me on the range. I have a, a display on the top, which is really easy um the putting software on it which which is pretty cool uh i liked it so much i just ordered another one so i have another one coming a quad the way i use it i use it a couple different ways last night i used it uh just with face and path with with hitting into a net because there was eight inches of snow on the ground and i didn't want to <laughs> use all the golf balls that we we have for about a month of use and uh i had other people hitting in other stations where there was free hitting out into the, into the snow. So I like to have different stations. So Foresight allows me to do that. They can also play holes. I might have guys play two or three holes or do some kind of skills testing, depending on the age range, they might do the smashing the glass or, or whatever uh, those things might be. So that's my application with Foresight, not to mention uh, during COVID, I actually brought it home and I don't do this much, but I actually played a few holes on my foresight quad with my son and experienced the whole uh round of golf for for the first time for me ironically so it was kind of cool uh to set it up in the basement bring it home it's easy it's bulletproof uh provides pretty pretty darn good information too so that's how i use my foresight i got another one because um i want to start renting it out to, to people and uh, a lot of them like to get the data and I like to have that exact number all the time. I had a guy in yesterday that, uh, that popped in that has a, that just brought a, uh, a use um, two and with HMT, but he still likes to come in and double check his numbers with, with my quad. So <laughs> he, was, he was on track, but uh, that's just my personal use and, and how things are used at my facility and, and with Foresight. I think we've seen a proliferation as well out on the different tours uh, when it comes to quad usage in the last year. 
Uh, and that's due to a couple of different reasons. Uh, number one, the LCD display that's native on the unit, uh, that, that just adds ease of use. You know, a lot of the players, they don't want to have to hook up a computer or a phone. Um, they don't want to have to add a secondary modality to be able to capture data. So being able to plop down a Foresight quad unit on the range um, and hit a couple shots and get instant data without having to hook up any external modalities is very attractive to a lot of those players. Then once again, that pre-normalized data um, where the data that it gives you is, is kind of normalized to begin with and uh, standardized for all environmental conditions. Uh, and then obviously the, the tolerances and the precision that optical can provide. Um, you know, we, I think that that speaks to the reason why we've seen so many tour professionals uh, switch from the Doppler systems to optical. You know, if you look at all of the best players in the world, most of these guys have both Doppler and optical systems at their disposal. Uh, and they're using the optical systems for club delivery uh, and launch metrics. Uh, and then they're using the Doppler systems for ball metrics downrange. Uh, and you'll see the same thing at OEM departments, OEM R&D departments. Um, my time in the industry has taken me into the R&D world with a couple of different major brands. Uh, and, and in those major brands, you know, all of the different technologies are brought to bear. Understanding the, the strengths and weaknesses of every platform is unbelievably important. And that's the reason why the OEMs utilize all these different platforms is because they're basically taking the data points uh, from each of these systems that uh, those parameters are, are known to be, you know, tight tolerances and precise. So, um, <clears throat> Tim, tell me what's coming up uh, on FSX Pro, which seems to be right. In here, right? Two weeks. Uh, so that's, you know, a major initiative within Foresight is to upgrade the entire software suite. Um, I think, you know, self-admittedly, Foresight, we, we've known that the software had a long way to go as far as the user interface and the overall user experience. Uh, so Liam and myself and a few other folks over the last year have been working on uh, a completely new software suite. Uh, I will say that for folks that are familiar with Foresight's competitors, as far as the software uh, that uh, is utilized in those platforms, they'll be very comfortable working in the new FSX Pro platform. Um, it gives you a lot more customization. Uh, the user interface is much friendlier to the eye. Um, and, and I think that it's a far improved product over what has been out there in the past as far as FSX software. Uh, so for all of you Foresight users, I know that you'll be very excited to begin using that module. Um, there are gonna be additional modules that are added into that over time. Uh, and there'll be an upgrade to the, the putting interface uh, over the course of this year as well. So there are a lot of you know, uh, lofty goals and ambitions within the Foresight team. Uh, not just to focus on the simulator and launch monitor products, but also there are some other products in the pipeline that are going to be pretty cool. And the idea is uh, to, to deliver a suite of technology products that help transform the game and kind of bring it forward uh, into more of the new age with, with some technology and uh, enhancing experiences, so to speak, through all these different technology means. So please tell me that the club display... <laughs> we'll be facing the same way that we're hitting now. It, uh, that is one of the things that we have deliberated on at length with uh, the beta test group. Uh, I think that everybody will be very happy with the options that are given as far as graphics. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I think with all user interfaces is everybody likes to look at things slightly differently. Uh, so give the user an option to look at it in the context that they want to look at things. Mm -hmm. uh, so if somebody wants to look at it from one perspective versus another perspective, give them the option to look at it in whatever perspective makes the most sense to them. That sounds good. Any other questions for, uh, for Tim here and Foresight? We had uh, one that came through. I, I don't know if you guys uh, saw it pop up there, but um, somebody asked me what what I have set up downstairs in my basement. Well, my basement is a hockey arena, but now uh, the <laughs> netting, the netting behind uh, one of the nets that was used for, for golf is now catching pucks. So I just have a net that falls down from, from the ceiling. Uh, it's just hooked 
uh, on top and I just threw a mat down and figured it would work and it, it worked great. Uh, just a straight hanging net. Um, but I only used it during COVID. I don't, I don't go down there and do anything at this time. But I think if, if anybody's building a new home or moving into a new home, I would definitely recommend having a, a home space that is, uh, if you're in the teaching arena, for sure, teaching and coaching, having a, your own space that you can do videos, uh, podcasts, whatever you're going to do, uh, that, that's your golf space that could be a simulator. Hey, look at Michael Breed. He's done a great job. Uh, Yep. Creating his little spot upstairs in, in, in his house. Right. So, uh, Joe, do you have anything, uh, for Tim before we, uh, before we move on? I don't think I do. No, I think he did a great job and thanks a lot, Tim, for, uh, for being on and, and teaching us, uh, all about the differences between optical and uh, Doppler. Appreciate your time. Thank, thank you so much for having us on and thanks for the opportunity. And if, uh, any folks out there have any questions regarding Foresight Sports, they can send me an email. My email is uh, T-B-R-I-A-N-D at foresightsports.com. It seems we have one that just came in from George here. Uh, does optical understand gear effect? All right, that's a great question. So there is no launch monitor right now that has a gear effect engine built into it. Um, now, that's a very complicated concept because you're talking about CG placement and where that CG placement is relative to the face and how that affects MOI. And then it also affects uh, bulge and roll. The amount of bulge and roll on the face also affects this. Uh, and then obviously the speeds and the angles at which the ball is struck. Um, a lot of folks, a lot of really smart people are working on a gear effect engine, which can be put into uh, different launch monitors. But uh, as of right now, gear effect is, is, not accounted for as a component. That being said, uh, with the measurement of spin axis instead of the calculation of spin axis, uh, the gear effect component is kind of part of that spin axis calculation. It has an effect over spin axis, uh, and that's, ta that's part of the aggregate total of, of, si of quote unquote spin axis that you measure. Um, so, great question. I think that once gear effect uh, is, is accounted for in the ball flight engines across all launch monitors. It's really gonna help unlock even more understanding uh, because you know obviously hitting the ball a centimeter or two out on the toe has a drastic effect over you know the spin axis that the ball will fly even if the face and path are square. So great question. Alrighty, Tim, thanks. You're welcome to stick on if you want. We'll forward any questions to you if, uh... If you tune out, we truly appreciate your time. Enjoy the Thank sunny you. skies in Scottsdale. You guys see more sunshine there in one day than we see here in one month. It's so. been a nice week so far, 75 and not a cloud in the sky. So if you folks get snowed in, uh, try to make a trip out here to Scottsdale <laughs> and spend some time. But thanks for having us on. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Uh, Joe, uh, at this time, we're going we're gonna to just say thank you for being a part of the, the Michigan section over the last year and a half, two years. Originally, uh, we got to know each other through a mutual friend and, um, and got to know a little bit more about the Eastern chapter and to get more involved. And now at the section level with, uh, with providing the members an opportunity to, to let's say, educate their own membership uh, or their own students or contacts on simulation and have an incentive program put in front of, of them so that uh, they could earn a little bit of extra money. Um, if anybody wants more information about that, they can contact me uh, by email, jordan at jordanyounggolf.com, or you can pick it up on the section website. I believe it's posted there. But uh, again, Joe, thanks for willing to do some different things, uh, your sponsorship, and of course for uh, agreeing to, to put this together for, for our members. I think a lot of people might want to know maybe a little bit more about you, Ace Indoor Golf, possibly the facility, and what exactly you guys do down there in Slovenia. Thanks, Jordan, and yeah. nice to meet you all virtually. But we've uh, I've been in the business for... 15 years. Uh, my partner and I were the director of operations and CFO at About Golf um, 2005 to 2012. 
2012, I decided to go out on our own and um, we started Ace Indoor Golf and have been in business for about eight and a half years now. We um, work with uh, a handful of different technologies, Foresight obviously being one of them. We'll get um, the other ones being True Golf, Unicor, and Skytrack. We'll get those on the, on the other six webinars. We do a lot with V1 Sports, that's also located in, in Michigan for teaching analysis. But so our goal and what we've specialized in is, is basically the customization of, of, of golf simulators. Our company provides the Foresight Sim in the Box, and um, we do all the custom work for Foresight and a couple other simulator systems. We have a, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen real quick. And I think a lot of people really don't understand. Um, kind of what goes into a golf simulator. So this is uh, some pictures of our of our so shop in, in Toledo, Ohio. So we have about a 10,000 square foot facility where we actually make a lot of the golf screens that you that you see online and, and for Foresight our PJ Tour Superstore is a customer of ours. Um, so yeah, we have a full design department and, uh, reason why, Jordan, reason why we got started is I think you wanted to, you had a question with a customer who wanted a golf simulator and our goal with you guys is you guys, you guys are the, in contact with your members all the time. In the 15 years I've been doing this, I've never seen the golf simulator business so busy. Um, at the beginning, when I was in this, with the four thirty, forty thousand dollars simulators, they've gone down to now you can get one for a couple thousand. But at some point, we were all like, you know what? It's going to get saturated. It's going to get saturated. People are going to stop buying, and now it's everybody's very busy. So our goal with you guys, and I've asked this, and in the past, I've asked a lot of people with the OEMs, and, and a lot of the members will probably come to you as professionals and say, hey, what do you think about technology? And you may or may not know how to answer the questions, but then they'll go work with somebody else. So our goal is to get you guys educated um, enough to, you can at least speak intelligently about, you know, what fits in different rooms, what technologies to use. You can work with Jordan, you can work with, who will work with us direct, but we'll go through and, and help you basically sell simulators. And, and obviously you guys get a commission on it, but you guys should, with your with your relationships and your knowledge, you you guys really should be making a little bit of money uh, on 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 your members buying simulators because I can tell you a lot of them are. I think you're muted, Jordan. There we go. Sorry, Joe. Tell us a little bit about um, the range of product projects you do. I mean, you you do a lot of work with foresight but uh there are skytrack work that work that you do you, you're getting in, the unicor is, is becoming more popular now um you know a lot of the questions we get from people are well what are the recommendations for a room size what what are the recommendations for what unit i should go with well everybody's different right i mean everybody has a different setup different height of ceiling different space different use. I mean, one person might just want to use it for playing golf on by themselves. Another might have a family of kids and want to entertain with everybody. There's all the kinds of different uses and some are better used for different situations. Correct? Correct. So one of the, I mean, Jordan hit it on the on nail on the head. Um, space and budget are the two biggest things that, that we have to work through. Um, space being obviously this, the height of the of the of the room is is key for the overhead camera systems. We typically like to see ten feet plus or minus six inches. The way these overhead camera systems are built with built with their lenses, they're able to focus down on the golf ball. So their focus range is is about ten about ten feet. So anything lower than that, typically there's there's a little bit of issues with it picking up correctly. If the ceilings are higher, we can always lower it down to the 10 foot range via some pipes or however we go about doing that. 
Um, the other issue with the overhead camera systems is, unless you have a dual one, but for the most part, they work individually. You need to have what we call a center strike system. So it means you're standing right or left to center and you're hitting down the middle because they're focused on, uh, on a single point. Those rooms, typically we recommend a minimum of 14 feet. Um, unless you get the Hawk, Hawk built in has two different cameras within the unit itself. So you can go down to about 13 feet. Depth wise, we like to see 20 feet. So if people ask me the ideal room, the ideal room in my personal opinion is 15 feet wide, 20 foot long and 10 foot high. It, then plus whatever seating you want outside the, uh, the 20 foot area. Joe, can you hear me? I can hear you. Are you able to see this screen? I can see your file explorer. So I don't okay, see the we're back to there again. All right. Sorry. Yeah. All right. We're back to normal here. Yeah. All right. Let's try this one more time. So one of the questions that somebody asked you was what do you have in your space? So this is, this is a custom design build we did. I think there was five simulators. This is in Ankeny, Iowa. Um, we actually completely built this whole place, including all those countertops and everything you see there, all the, all the knee walls. Um, so this is an indoor facility that we did where they charge to play by the hour. Um, they've got some, some beer and wine, some food that they do there, but we built those, those booths are about 15 foot wide, 20 foot in depth and about 10 foot tall. Um, all custom made by us. We work with, you know, the customer, you guys, we provide a full set of design prints and for the elect any electric electrical work any construction work um, and then we come in and do the do the full install let's see if I can pull up some more here are you able to see any of these nope back to your Explorer I mean I can see them on your Explorer yeah so that's a you want to click on that one is that opened up now it's probably in your it's probably in your other okay. whatever program you use um, that might be the best I can do right here. Yeah, so that one, that highlight right there, that's in a garage out in uh, California. Um, a lot of people, because they don't have spaces out in their garage. So again, back to the question that somebody asked, what do you have? So we do, our goal is to cut, we, we customize anything. We don't have any preset packages. Uh, we do have enclosures. That's a 12 foot wide enclosure, nine foot tall that we did out in California. That's obviously a quad. Um, limited space. Um, we do netting. We do screens. If somebody just wants to buy a screen for their basement or, or any room in the house, we custom make them in that facility you saw in Toledo. So our goal, most of the time, if it's, you know, if it's a Skytrack, if it's, if it's a quad, something that sits on the floor because it sits right next to you, I typically tell people if you, could, if you feel comfortable swinging a golf club in the room, we can do it. The another topic that that's pretty hot is the um, screens. So a lot of people purchase screens. They end up purchasing replacement screens, or screens get damaged. Is there a, a hierarchy of screens? Um, if you do have a screen, you should also have a projector. And right. I think a lot of people make some mistakes with projectors and screen purchases if they're just starting out. Yeah, actually, I see a ton of that. Let me, let me see if I can. And I mean, we can probably do a half hour on this, but yeah, I just me, wanted to at least bring it up. Let me, I think this is it. So, so one, Joe, one of the questions that just popped up was, um, what are those dimensions again? Was it 10 foot high, 20 deep and 15 wide? Is it was. That correct? Yeah, 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 that's ideal. That is correct. Yeah, so we can definitely go obviously larger we can definitely go smaller um but if somebody said you know i'm building from scratch that's what i'd recommend yeah that's um, just the footprint that's just a footprint if you need if you yeah so if you that's that's the actual simulator area where you're swinging a golf club um for safety reasons for clearance reasons so nobody gets whacked with the club but if you if you want additional space for seating or a bar area then that should be outside those dimensions that's strictly the golf similar area. So for all you Detroit Tigers fans out there, this is actually um, Ian Kinsler's design, second baseman for the Tigers a, few, a couple years back. So we're doing his house in Dallas, Texas here this month. 
but this is we're actually doing it in his in his garage so he's taking his full three car garage um and converting it to a golf simulator room with um he's getting a hawk which is right here he's also getting full video analysis video analysis uh cameras as well so what we'll do is we'll send his contractor all this information so here's the screen system we're doing two retractable curtains which you can see here um placement of the of the hawk we have some electrical and some conduit that the conduit will be ran down to wherever the computer is going for the cat six cable um where exactly he's hitting back here is the projector and another some electrical and another conduit to run down there for the hdmi cable so all those dimensions are listed that's what we work with you guys and your you know and your members or whoever you know with and then back to Jordan's original question, and this is and this is one of the trickiest things. I see people mess this up all the time. Is screen and projector placement. So, based upon the size of the room, we'll either do what we call a sixteen ten aspect ratio screen or a four three aspect ratio screen, and then we'll determine where is the proper placement of the projector. Most of the time, 99% of our cases, we'll always put, put the projector behind the golfer for safety reasons. I, I am not a fan of putting the projector in front of you because it will get hit. It's not a matter of when, it's, it, I mean, if, it's a matter of when. So based upon our calculations and throw distances, we always go through a full design where we make sure that we put the image of the golfer, and this is basically a six foot golfer, back a certain point from the screen with the projector behind so we'll draw this cone um, with the proper throw distance to make sure that there's no shadow of the golfer on on the screen um, it's it's really not that hard to understand once you know what you're looking for as far as the viewable area two things you need to know the viewable width and the throw distance of the projector and then you'll figure out how you can install it as to not to create a shadow on the screen. So here's a question that came in. Can you cut a just floor joint in a basement to get more clearance? Ceiling is eight, if ceiling is eight feet without floor joint clearance would be nine feet. You'd have to have <laughs> it. Now, my background actually is, uh, so I was a nuclear operator. I was a, I operate one of the nuclear reactor plants on a uh, aircraft carrier, the USS Nimitz. So I do have an engineering background. I actually also worked for Pulte Homes for a while. And I, I would say that question is a big, big no. So you, most people, what they do um, is they actually dig down the basement for, with, if they have an eight foot, eight foot clearance. Um, terribly expensive, but that's what we've seen when people don't have the swing clearance. But as far as the floor joists go, it, obviously you're going to have to contact a, a construction or um, a structural engineer. But in most cases, they're going to tell you you can't do that. Even if you create the box out where you're swinging, I highly doubt that that can happen. You know, the whole uh, digging down, or you know, we have two or three clients right now, Joe, that are building new homes. And they've come to us and say exactly what is the floor or what is the footprint. And that's what they're doing. They're taking a section of their basement or mm -hmm. area and going down to create a 10 foot space footprint, but then creating a nice amphitheater type yeah. setting around it. And that, that's how people are changing. And um, most new home constructions have some kind of entertainment room anyways. Uh, most of these spaces can be used as, movie areas theaters entertaining whatever not not just golf so it kind of yeah we fits into we, the room yeah we did our trickiest room we ever did it was only 12 foot wide so we we did a dual a, it was basically a gc2 at the time so we did dual G, gc2s where you stand in the middle and hit to the sides because there was righties and lefties in the room we also did a drop down movie theater screen where we tucked it up inside the the, the floor joist pocket and mm -hmm. so it was flat and we padded it and we also did a full shooting simulator that's used by like u.s marshals and stuff like that so with the with the controller he can actually press one button and it can transfer either from a movie theater we actually recessed um 
flush wall mounted speakers behind the screen. So our screens are perforated so that the sound will come through. But we did, he had the ability to either play golf, have a fully functional shooting simulator, or have a movie theater in, in a 12 foot space. It was Interesting. Pretty, yeah. um, if we could get everybody just to type in the, the reason why they're on this call, um, whether, you know, for me, if I was in, I would be saying uh, for personal teaching and coaching usage, uh, maybe it's for your club, looking at a possibility of doing something at the club. We've, we have several clubs here in Michigan that are working with us right now to provide a, a simulator experience for their memberships. Um, or maybe, uh, maybe it's an at-home new construction. Maybe it's just for the education, which is fine too. Let us know a little bit about why you're on the call. We just want to get a quick demographic of, of, of why you're here and, and uh, those good things about simulation. Yeah. You know, I always like to know um, personally as much as I can. I'm always trying to learn. Um, good, thanks. We've got some home use, education, teaching, and club fitting. Great, great. I know that uh, a lot of the a lot of the, the fitters that, that we have come through, uh, they're either working with Foresight or TrackMan. Um, I see a lot of a lot of them moving towards the Foresight. Um, but, you know, technology changes so much. Education, good. Education. Also want to look at uh, what we can do for our club, teaching and fitting, for teaching. Education, teaching. I think one of the other things, as Jordan mentioned before, we do have five more series to go. Um, if there's any particular topics that you'd like us to cover or have guests on any future segments or shows, please type that in as well so we can, we can get that covered. Great. This is good. Thanks everybody for posting this. This is great. Good. Thanks, Nick. Home use build. Like I said, if you guys are looking to move into a new house or, or lucky enough to build a new house, I mean, I've got a way too big of a house. I have no room anywhere to put a simulator. So I failed big time. Um, teaching and club fitting. Yeah, try to get a space in, in, in your new house or, or if you move into a house and create your own little area. I know most of you know Jeff Goble, um, well-known coach and, and guy here in Michigan, PGA member. He's moving into a new house that he's having rebuilt. And he has a, his own area that uh, will be for teaching and coaching, which, which is pretty cool. I'm mean, looking forward to seeing that when it's completed. Mike, thanks for the comments. Uh, Mike McGonigal out in Grand Rapids. I've worked with Joe personally on two Hawk simulators at our club, and we have no regrets. Want to learn more on what these can do. Thanks, Joe. Awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah Mike. Um... Mike also has a had a, a member that um, we're doing a foresight hawk with. We actually combined it with a swing catalyst, um, right by his club in Egypt Valley, and um, Mike will be earning a nice five percent commission on that. And then Mike, thanks a lot for uh, referring Dan to us. Yeah, here's another good one from Rick. Look, look to add a simulator in the clubhouse for the winter months, a place for assistance to teach, assistance to teach during the winter. Teaching and club fitting, so good, great. I mean, this is a revenue source for not only assistant professionals, head professionals, but also uh, great for the members. And a lot of clubs are, are looking for ways to provide uh, more opportunities or added value for their membership. And I think that, uh, I think this is a great opportunity. Yeah. I think more and more private clubs and even public clubs are, you know, for the, for the private clubs, it's almost a necessary amenity at this point. Um, it's a way to get members into the clubs in the winter months. It's also a way to generate revenue, whether it's, uh, them coming in with a foursome to play courses, which obviously increases your food and beverage sales, or it's private membership, it's private lessons or fittings, which increases obviously um, the pros and the system pros uh, um, revenue as well. Pri the public, anybody in here on public, it's a great way to generate revenue during the winter months. I know a lot of you guys are probably like, eh, I really don't want to work that hard. I work 
work a lot of hours in the spring and summer and the fall, but it's a, uh, we typically see anywhere from 30 to 50 bucks an hour um, being generated per simulator, obviously food and beverage on top of that. Um, and it's getting more, like I said, it's getting more and more popular. It, the accuracy is, is gone way up. The graphics have gotten better. Um, in the past, it's, hey, I hit a shot, didn't do what I thought it would be doing, so I don't want to do it. Um, but nowadays, it, with the accuracy, it, it's, really, it's really fun. It's great for game improvement and um, come a long way here in the last, uh, just the last few years, it's come a long way. Joe, can you share, um, I'll share mine, but also share yours. If you would like to contact either of us to, to get more information or, uh, you know, try to learn more about what might be best for your, your solution, you can contact me at Jordan at jordanyounggolf.com. So Jordan at jordanyounggolf.com. Uh, Joe, if you want to give your email. Yeah, it's just uh, Joe, J-O-E, at aceindoorgolf.com. So pretty easy. Um, a lot of you might have my contact information, but like I said, uh, you can reach out to us at any time. Most of this how it works, if you have members or you're, you're interested in, your, in getting something for your club or yourself, we set up a little uh, Zoom console just like this. We go through what your solution is, try to provide the best possible um, system for you, uh, for your needs, and uh, try to cut through all the crap you might have to uh, look online and, and learn about. And, and this is going to cut a lot of corners for you as far as uh, saving on, on going down the wrong path or, or the rabbit hole like, uh, like Tim mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I know we had Foresight here on our first uh, webinar, but we will have other technologies on, on the next remaining five. So we are not tied into one, sim one similar technology. So as Jordan said before, it's really, our goal is to be more of consultants, what's best for the customer's needs, your needs, what's your budget, what's your space. And then we really try to provide the biggest bang for your buck. Um, I don't have a, you know, I got a pretty big facility, but I don't have all the overhead and R&D. You know, I, I make a lot of the stuff for the major OEMs. So we typically cut out a lot of the pricing, especially from the customization screen side. I don't need to double and then double my prices like some of them do. So we're, we provide the same great service the OEMs do at, at a pretty affordable price. Um, Mike posted uh, another a great comment here, Mike McGonigal. Uh, we run an unlimited package where members can use every day of the week, max two hours during the week per day, and one hours on weekends per day. We have billed 22, or we have 22 billed equaling 17,000 in revenue. So pretty good, pretty good start for them. I think this is their second year, Joe? With yeah, it's your second, second season. Yeah. So and we, then, we, yeah, they have two, they have two. So what we did for them, which probably is good for a lot of people is we actually have two structures that are fairly simple to put up and down. So what we do is we go in there in November or, and then we take them down in April. So that way we used uh, a space that, that probably doesn't get used, especially with COVID nowadays. Um, so we do have a capability of putting something in for the, for the winter months where you guys can generate this revenue and then as you need the space when the golfers come back we can we can take them down um joe robert bowden said uh is it possible to come down and check out your operations sometimes it's easier to talk through in person i don't think you're against that sometimes we visit we facilities time. too right yeah, <laughs> yeah, we do it all the time. Time. either come to you or you guys can come down to us so we have um we have a, a true golf real nice true golf facility um, in the area, we have a Foresight Hawk quad at a country club called Stone Oak. And then we have a, a Unicore IXO with video analysis systems at Brandywine in Maumee, Ohio. So if you guys want to come down, see the facility, check out some different technologies, you're more than welcome to make the drive down. Or um, I think Saturday after, I think it was the second, we drove up to a house um, on, on Warwick Hills to, to take a look at a space for, for a couple are going to be putting a similar in. So we'll come to you. You guys come to us either way. Well, everybody, thank you so much. I know we're, uh, we're coming up on 12 o'clock here.
if anybody has any last uh, second questions, we'll, we'll answer them real quick. Uh, do you have any information on business plans for starting indoor commercial space? Yes, we do, Lee. Uh, we do have access. We can email those to you. Just reach out to me via text and, and I'll get those out to you. Um, any last questions? Again, thanks to Diane for being behind the scenes and helping keep us straight up, uh, up front here. Thanks to the Michigan section, Joe, uh, appreciate your time. Uh, I believe this will be posted on the Michigan section website. So uh, if you missed it, or if you wanted to direct some people there, they can certainly watch it too. Two more weeks, we'll have our uh, round number two, as we'll call it, our spin on simulation. So hopefully you'll join us Wednesday at 11 in a couple of weeks. Again, thanks for joining us. Hope you learned a few things. And if you have any questions, reach out to Joe or I via email. Thanks so much. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks, everyone.